Good morning, church. <coughs> Can you imagine... Oh, and happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Can you imagine being in a world where there's a dictator and uh, we are the foreigners in that world? And so we move into that world, and because we the foreigners, we are second-class citizens, and they make laborers out of us. But we start to increase in numbers, and so they get worried. They like to have us in their homes, uh, making their beds and making them coffee and serving them, but they don't know about us getting bigger in number, and maybe one day rising up and taking over. And so... Our king, our dictator, the governor of northern Kentucky, puts out an edict. And he says, I want every male child thrown in the Ohio River the moment that baby is born. And if there's not a midwife, then the mother has to do that. Could you imagine living in a world like that? And so we have Moses in Exodus chapter 2 being born. He's been born to Amram and Jochebed. Jochebed uh, has a son, Aaron, and has a, another daughter called Miriam. And so it's a beautiful family of five. And everything seems to be going well till this edict comes out and she falls pregnant and she's about to have this child and they can imagine as the midwife is delivering the baby, what are they asking? Is it going to be a girl or a boy? If it's a girl, not a problem. If it's a boy, that's a death sentence. And so she gets the news. No, it's a boy. Well, the story starts with this man coming from, a, from the tribe of Levi, going to the tribe of Levi and taking for himself a wife. And she conceives and has a child. She, she looks at this baby and this baby is beautiful and she can't, she can't let this baby die. And so she decides to hide him for three months. But after three months, she can't hide him anymore. And so she comes up with this plan. And, and Gary, I have to think that God's uh, hand was in this plan. You know, God's providential care was working things out where we couldn't work it out. This morning at the Transitional Center, Gary was leading a prayer. And there were 15 people in attendance. And uh, uh, many of them are, are very elderly. Some have dementia and Alzheimer's. And, and some are just struggling with different situations. And so in his prayer, he's praying, uh, Lord, please uh, uh, help us to go home. Help us to eventually be able to be saved and to come home. Well, one of these ladies picks up on that word, home. So after his prayer, she says, I want to go home, but I don't have a car. And Gary says, I will take you home. And I know Gary meant that spiritually. But you see, there comes a time when I'm thinking, my, and I'm scratching my head, and Gary, I'm thinking, how do you come to a solution with that? You know, what do you do in a situation like that? And God says, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And so, yeah, we have, the, have God saying, I will take care of this. I will, you just do what you need to do. See, a murder is against the commandments of God, right? And, and so you have all these mothers listening to Pharaoh, throwing their babies into the Nile. But one mother saying, no, that's against God's word. I can't do that. Hides him for three months because she's not afraid. The New Testament says in Hebrews 11, she was not afraid of Pharaoh. So she hid him as long as she could. But she had to eventually take him to the Nile. And so she doesn't throw him in the Nile, but she does deliver the baby to the Nile. So in a way, she's doing it right. But she knows where the princess, Pharaoh's daughter, bathes with her young ladies and her servant. And so she, she makes this, this basket. The word for basket is the, is the Hebrew word teva. And, and it, it's, a very, it's a very common word. It's used in Genesis chapter 6. The same word teva is used. You know what it is? Teva is the ark. So, so she takes this teva, this basket, called an ark, and she, she makes reed and she puts pitch in it and, 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 and you know, different things to make sure it won't sink. She puts the baby in there and closes it up and puts the baby in the reeds, in the bulrushes, right there where the princess would come. So the princess comes down and the young ladies are walking up and down the river banks and the princess sees the baby. Maybe she heard the baby cry, I don't know, but she opens up the lid and what does she see? This beautiful baby. 
How many of you mothers understand what it means to look in the eyes of a baby and instantly bond, right? And that, that bond is there. I mean, I can see even some grandmothers smiling right now because they know what I'm talking about with, with grandbabies. And, and it does not even need to be your own biological child. You can look there, and this is the baby. This is Moses. The Bible says the baby was beautiful. But, but not beautiful in that this baby is going to win a beauty competition, but beautiful in that this is probably what's going to save the baby. So she, she, she opens up, and the baby's crying, and she has pity on the baby. And she says, this is a Hebrew child. Well, Miriam, the older sister, is hiding also over there. They couldn't send Aaron because Aaron is a boy. And he, he, you know, what's Aaron doing alive? That's a whole other story. Why is Aaron alive? You know? He'd probably get thrown in the Nile. So they, they hide the little boys away. But, but Miriam's there. And just at that moment when she sees this, says this is a Hebrew child, Miriam comes up with a suggestion. Well, if you want, I will go and call one of the Hebrew mothers, and she can nurse this child. Well, you see, there the solution is. The, the bond is formed. She's got this attachment to this child. She feels pity for this pa- child, more than just compassion, I think. And this little Hebrew lady, little girl, says, I've got a solution. So she says, go. So she goes and calls a Hebrew lady, Jochebed. Who do you think's is Jochebed? Jochebed is the mother her own, this Moses' own mother comes and she says, take this child and nurse this child in verse 9 and I will give you your wages. So in Exodus chapter 2, when you read the word, take this child, you read a very common word in Hebrew, except that's not the word being used here. It is the word take, but it's only used one time in the entire Bible and it means year it is yours. Here it is yours. In other words, this word, of all the words that could have been used, is an acknowledgement that I'm giving you one of yours back. It could mean that I'm giving you a Hebrew child because we Egyptians. Or it could mean, yeah, I'm giving you your child back. And I don't think she knew that she was giving this child back to the biological mother. Take care of this child till it's grown, which is about the year two or three years old. The baby will be weaned and legally able to be adopted in that culture. And so baby Moses, probably at the year 1526, is born and is given back to its mother, and the mother will raise the baby. And then the, mo- the, the mother brings the baby back and gives the baby to the, the princess, to Pharaoh's daughter, and he becomes her child. She becomes a mother to, to, to this baby. And the very next verse after this, verse 11, you see Moses start to work towards, and God's plan start to work towards saving the nation of Israel. So what we've seen here, we've seen the roots of Moses. We know when he was born. We know who his dad was. We know the, the Pharaoh. We know the mother. We know the brother. We know the sister. We know everything. We know the roots. But did you notice that no names were mentioned. It talks about his father. It talks about his mother. It talks about Pharaoh's daughter. No names are mentioned. It talks about a slave girl drawing Moses out, the princess's slave, drawing the baby out of the water. God has a plan to save his people. And at this point of time, the plan is Moses, literally meaning, according to our text, one that has been drawn out of water. And so, so God has a plan to, to resurrect us out of the water, out of the ark, out of the basket. But he doesn't specify names. And I have to imagine behind every person that ever comes to know the Lord, every person that was ever a part of the nation of Israel, of God saved people throughout all time, I have to imagine that there were mothers. There were people in the background of Jesus' ministry. Remember that? There are people in your background. You don't know them all probably. I know that there were many people in, the back, in my background that helped me to, to grow up to become a person that could eventually spread God's word. But, but think about it. How many women, unnamed women, do we have here? First of all, <clears throat> we must have had a midwife, right? 
We don't know who she is. She wouldn't kill the baby. We had Moses' mother. She wouldn't kill the baby. We had Miriam, who was only there to do good for the child. She wouldn't hurt the baby. We have the servant that drew the baby out the water. We have the princess. So far, without even digging really deep, I can come up with five women. We see the roots. We see the rescue or, or, or the rearing up of this child. And we see the resurrection of this child. And we realize something really great has happened. But I want you to think for a second. Could you imagine being a mother and taking your child and putting your child in a basket and letting your child go at three months of age? We have an eight-month child there. Could you do that, Kate? If, if that was the only way your baby could be saved... What kind of love would it take to do that? You all get what I'm saying? Unbelievable. And then you get the baby back and you hang on to that baby and you have that baby a second time, like a do-over, and you have to give your baby up again. But who are you giving your baby up to? You're giving your baby up to your enemy. I wonder what Pharaoh said to that nation to justify killing those babies. I know what was going on. I know that they were afraid of being taken over. But brethren, it's not in our nature to kill a baby. So something else was happening. And the country that I came from gives me a little bit of insight to, I think, what was going on. I think there was a lot of racism here. I think they were told that these children, these Israelite children, were not real people. They're not even second-class citizens. They, they, they don't even have a soul. I mean, you've got to really be something to kill a baby. And they did. They did. And then to have to lose your baby. How many of you have lost your children? I mean, in like in a store... <laughs> Anybody, I've been the victim of having walked away from my mother, so I can only imagine what my mother would have uh, felt like. But I remember there's a story about a little boy in a, in a supermarket, and he's, he's lost his mother. And so he, he's calling out, he's calling out. Eventually his mother's frantic, and she's looking, and she hears, Martha, Martha, Martha. And she goes running to her child, and she puts her arms around her baby, you know, and, and then hugs him, and then pushes him back, and says, but why do you call me Martha. He said, because I tried mother, but it didn't work. There are too many mothers around here. <laughs> it's, it's scary. It's scary having to lose your child. It's scary because of love, having to give your child away. I can't even begin to imagine what it would have been like. But it was there. It was there. You know, it is said that you know that you become a mother. When certain things happen, when everything that you tie, you tie double knot. You know you become a mother when you're uh, singing Barney songs while doing the dishes. You know you become a mommy when uh, you're looking for your sunglasses and eventually your child says, Mom, why don't you try those in your forehead? <laughs> you know you, you, you're a mother when you hear a baby cry in a supermarket and you start rocking. And your baby's been out the house for 20 years, has their own children, <laughs> and you're a grandparent, Right? You're always a mother. You'll always have that in you. You know that you're a mother, that you've stepped over to become a mother when you're at a romantic meal with your husband and you reach over and you start to cut his meat. <laughs> I remember this dad was very proud of the day he got married and he's telling his son in depth the story of when we got married and, and, and he's thinking about all the things and, and eventually he comes to this picture that is his favorite and he's standing there and he's looking at his, his bride coming down the aisle and, and she's there and he's lost in thought and the little boy looks at the daddy and says, Daddy, is that when mommy came to work for us? <laughs> But getting back to the, the real meaning of this, of, of, of Exodus chapter 2, there was an ark involved. The same ark that saved eight souls, as 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 said, is the same ark that saved Moses. 
He became, he wasn't even called Moses by his mother. He, be, he was named Moses. He was called that which is resurrected from the water. And for 2,000 years, we in the Christian church, we in the church of Christ, have been calling our children Moses. Think about it. We've been giving up our children. Little boys, when they are 12, 13, little girls, when they're 11, 12 years old, they come to this realization that they need to be saved. And it's at that point they say, Mom, Dad, I want to be born again. What does that say to a mother? Well, you know, you've already been born. But every mother realizes this child, I must give this child away. This child must be born again in order to get into the ark. What is the ark? 1 Peter 3.18 talks about the ark talks about Noah, but then it says this, and it talks about the Holy Spirit that was there during the time of Noah still being present in our time, and that same ark, that same Holy Spirit reveals the ark today. This is it, 1 Peter 3.21, the like figure, like to the ark, the like figure that now doth save even what? Baptism, not the washing of the filth of the flesh, but the calling to God of a clear conscience. If you want to get into the ark, folks, that's the only way you can be saved. There is no other name under heaven by which you can be saved. You weren't saved before Jesus came to this world. You were saved after Jesus died, after he was buried, after he resurrected. And he showed us that he was the ark, he was the vehicle. And so you too die. You too are buried with him. You die with him, you're buried with him, and you resurrect with him. You are, you are Moses. You lose your name. You're Christian. You're a disciple. You are a follower of Christ. You are a Moses. You are drawn from the water. Don't say Mother's Day or Happy Mother's Day with your mouth only. Say it with your actions. If you haven't been born again, if you haven't gotten into Jesus, what's holding you back? And if you have gotten into that ark, and like Noah, you did eventually get out and walk on dry land. But you've wandered away from your beliefs. You've wandered away. What kind, type of a mother's day is this when their child is walking away? I hear so many mothers say, you know, at least I can still pray for my child. And I'm thinking, that's so sad. So many mothers have children who are not living holy lives anymore. Please decide to come back to Jesus Come back to that vessel, the only vessel that can take you home. Right now, as together we stand and sing.